Our first lesson is from Luke 22, 31 through 38, and that's on page 1,638 in your pew Bible. Luke 22. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked you, or excuse me, I'll start again. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am not, or excuse me, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Thank you. Good singing. There has been a change from your bulletin. Our second scripture lesson will be Matthew 26, verses 47 through 56. And you'll find that on page 1,545 in your pew Bibles. The John passage is also fun. You can read that at home. So let us now hear the passage from Matthew. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. This week after the shooting at Michigan State, I switched our sermon theme to be violence and school shootings. So let us begin today by remembering the 25 deadliest school shootings in America. These are all experienced during the lifetimes of people in our congregation. 1940, South Pasadena Junior High, South Pasadena, California, five murdered, 
two injured. Nineteen sixty six, Rosemar College of Beauty, Mesa, Arizona. Five murdered, two injured. Nineteen sixty six, University of Texas, Austin, Texas. Fifteen murdered, thirty one injured. 1976, California State University, Fullerton, California. Seven murdered, two injured. 1989, Cleveland Elementary, Stockton, California. Six murdered, 29 injured. 1991, University of Iowa, Iowa City, Iowa. Six murdered, one injured. 1992, Lyndhurst High School, Olivehurst, California. Four murdered, 10 injured. 1998, Thurston High School, Springfield, Oregon. Four murdered, 25 injured. 1998, Westside Middle School, Craighead County, Arkansas. Five murdered, 10 injured. 1999, Columbine High School, Littleton, Colorado. 13 murdered, 24 injured. 2005, Red Lake School, Red Lake, Minnesota. 10 murdered, 5 injured. 2006, West Nickel Mines School, Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. 6 murdered, 3 injured. 2007, Virginia Tech University, Blacksburg, Virginia. 33 murdered, 23 injured. 2008, Northern Illinois University, DeKalb, Illinois. Five murdered, 21 injured. 2012, Sandy Hook Elementary, Newton, Connecticut. 27 murdered, two injured. 2012, Oikos University, Oakland, California. Seven murdered, three injured. 2013, Santa Monica College, Santa Monica, California. Six murdered, four injured. 2014, Isla Vista, St. Barbara, California. Six murdered, 13 injured. 2014, Marysville Pilchuck High School, Marysville, Washington. Six murdered, one injured. 2015, Umpqua Community College, Roseburg, Oregon. Nine murdered, nine injured. 2017, Rancho Tijama Elementary School, Rancho Tijama, California. Six murdered, 18 injured. 2018, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, Parkland,
Florida. 17 murdered, 17 injured. Two thousand and eighteen, Santa Fe High School, Santa Fe, Texas. Ten murdered, murdered, thirteen injured. Twenty twenty one, Oxford High School, Oxford, Michigan. Four murdered, seven injured. 2022, Robb Elementary School, Uvalde, Texas. 21 murdered, 17 injured. 2023, Michigan State University, Lansing, Michigan. Three murdered, five injured. 2020, while 43% of all gun deaths were those types of murders, 54% of all gun deaths were suicides. In 2020, there were 24,292 of them. As people are more isolated than ever, and as mental health continues to deteriorate in our country, the prevalence of guns and their easy availability through either personal purchases or through the use of a friend or family member's firearm has made both suicide and mass shootings far more prevalent now than at any other time in our American history. Now, the shooting at MSU this week was notable for another reason. For several of the students at MSU, this was not their first experience of a mass school shooting. Emma Riddle had come to MSU after surviving the shooting at Oxford High School in 2021. <coughs> The same was true of her MSU classmates, Ferguson and Mancini. In the same way, Jackie Matthews was in the sixth grade when she survived the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut. Jackie is now a senior at MSU. And all of the trauma of the Sandy Hook massacre came flooding back into her mind <coughs> on Monday as the notice of an active shooter on her MSU campus appeared on her phone. 
My friends, when we have students who have personally experienced two mass school shootings, that is when we know for certain that gun violence is no longer just a rare or isolated incident. It is an epidemic of violence. It is a recurring nightmare. It is traumatizing us as a country. Now in our second scripture reading today from Matthew 25, we find a particular pray, phrase that resonates in this moment in our American experience. The phrase is, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Let's update this idea for 2023. <clears throat> all who draw a gun will die by a gun. We as a country are dying by guns because we rely so heavily upon them. We have too many guns and too many people who have too ready access to them. Now please don't misunderstand me. I grew up on a small farm and on our farm, guns were tools that we used on the farm. When our farm animals were sick and dying, we used guns to put them out of their misery. Guns were also a way to stop the raccoon that was raiding and killing our chickens at night. My father and my brother also used guns to hunt for deer and for other game. And we supplemented our, school, our food supply in the 70s with venison and pheasant. I still fondly remember the Sunday that my dad grilled pheasant on his charcoal grill and served it with barbecue sauce. I got a drumstick. It was delicious. That's how I grew up. But the guns that are causing such a problem in our country today are not the deer hunting rifles or the historical weapons like muzzle loaders that collectors track down and lovingly care for. The weapons that are causing such an epidemic of violence are the guns that are designed to kill human beings. Those guns are doing what they were designed to do. Now, I believe there are two primary reasons why people purchase guns. The first is because holding a gun makes you feel ultimately powerful. When you hold in your hands a weapon that can instantly end another person's life, you have in your hands the ability that is normally not granted to human beings. The death that guns provide is not an up-close and personal death that would be caused by a fist or by a knife, but guns cause death from a distance, maybe even without getting bloody at all. But just by pulling a small trigger, you now have the life and death power of God in your hands. Now it is our human nature to want power, to want to use that power to secure our influence over other people. The other reason that people purchase a gun is because of fear. Because so many other people own guns and because mass shootings have become so common, we have become a people who are very afraid. Many folks are purchasing guns and getting concealed carry permits so that they feel protected by themselves if a gunman ever happened to threaten them. But what they do not understand is that by purchasing yet another gun, they are making guns even more prevalent and even more common. People purchasing guns through their fear are just adding to the problem of easy gun availability. They are giving more family members and friends even more opportunities to obtain a gun and to either harm others that they are angry with or else, and more likely, to commit suicide with that firearm. So my friends, what does this terrible epidemic of gun violence mean for us today? What can we do as Christians? to help end this problem. Well, over 365 times in the Bible, 
we are encouraged not to be afraid. We must not give in to our fear of death by gunfire to purchase more guns, to exacerbate the problem, and to create more opportunities for those guns to fall into the wrong hands. Secondly, we must take every opportunity to vote for and to provide people with the mental health care that they so desperately need. All people are broken in big or small ways. We are all hurting and afraid to some degree. But with the increasing isolation that comes from our social media addicted world, we need to be advocates for real relationships, for face-to-face -face activities. We are to be the friends to others that we ourselves want and need in our own lives. Finally, and most importantly, I believe we need to be advocates for better regulation of firearms in our country. Now, on Wednesday this week, at about 4 p.m., the office manager, Jackie, and I, we noticed a Jeep that had pulled in and was parked in the back of the church parking lot. They didn't leave for a while, and we were kind of curious what they were up to, so we went and looked out the back doors of the church. We were surprised to see that a man had set up a bunch of parking cones in our back parking lot and he was attempting to teach a teenage girl how to parallel park her Jeep. We watched for a bit. From what we saw, she needed a lot more practice in order to pass her official driving test. And I could not help but compare the very difficult and highly regulated processes and procedures that we have for legally driving cars in the United States and comparing that to the systems that we have in place for regulating our firearms. My friends, what would happen if we demand that same level of accountability for every gun sold in America? What would such a demand help to do to help protect the least of these among us? Maybe it would cause one less school shooting per year? To even save just one life, I believe that such increased regulation would indeed be worth it. So my friends, in conclusion, it's no secret why we have such a problem with gun violence here in the United States. We are all sinful and we crave to have power. We crave to feel safe. But ultimately, our trust should not be in the power or the security that comes from owning a gun. Our security should be in our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So be it. Amen.